Yeah, welcome back. It's time now to go to the papers and see what the headlines are. And um, we're going to be doing that with um, Professor Fage, who has joined us here today to uh, x-ray some of these headlines and make sense of it. Professor Fage, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning and thank you. Okay, so we're going to begin with the Punch newspaper um, to take some of the headlines that we, we are seeing here. The biggest headline here, or the boldest headline here, is federal government may sp spend 3.27 trillion naira on palliatives and loans. And the writers on that story uh, are that um, 15 million households to get 1.13 trillion naira for three months, uh, 125 billion naira for MSMEs and others. Then PWDs demand more palliatives from Somolu. Quara IDPs get relief materials. Okay, federal government may spend 3.27 trillion naira on palliatives. That is in the next three months. Your comments, please, sir. Yeah, um, this shows the, the negative effect of uh, uh, the subsidy removal and the, the devaluation of the Naira, which has been the major plank of this uh, administration policy in the last uh, four months. And uh, now what it shows that uh, in order for the government uh, to, you know, be able to cushion the effect of uh, uh, these uh, twin policies, uh, it needs about three point something trillion naira, uh, and uh, this will deepen uh, uh, the economic crisis uh, in the country because one, the palliatives may be too short and too small; uh, they may not be able to take uh, the uh, put their poor people out of. Um, uh, the situation that they have been plunged into as a result of this policy. Secondly, by borrowing money, we are going deep, deeper and deeper into the debt uh, crisis, uh, which means uh, we'll be running in cycle. Uh, the, the intended effect of uh, the oil removal, uh, subsidy removal, and the devaluation of Naira will not in any way uh, take us out of the deldrum. On the contrary, uh, it will uh, push us deeper and deeper into uh, the same. Because a debt uh, of about uh, 3.2 trillion uh, debt and uh, you know subsidy is just showing that uh, uh, we are not uh, addressing the real economic challenges and problem in the country. It is really funny because when I was reading up on this, um, I found that in the 2023 budget, the Nigerian government budgeted 3.6 trillion naira for petrol subsidy for six months ending in June. So from January to June, it cost us uh, uh, 3.6 million naira to subsidize fuel. And now we are going to spend that same amount for palliatives and say that we have removed fuel subsidy and this money will be spent in three months for people and, and to do, for subsidies that may not even right. get to anybody. Yes, you see it is not going to anybody and that is why right from the beginning some people are of the opinion that uh, the government should not have removed the subsidy in the first place. What they need to do is to take measures, policy measures, to, to see who are sabotaging uh, the subsidy, who are benefiting from it, and then they deal with them according to the laws of the land. But somehow the government bought into the idea of subsidy removal, and here we are. Uh, we are going to spend more than what we used to spend on subsidy. Uh, what we are now planning in three months will be is higher or equivalent to uh, what we spent on uh, subsidy in six months. Mm. And the subsidy is such that no matter what, it benefited greater number of Nigerians. Mm. But now with the removal, uh, with statistics showing, over 63% of uh, Nigerians are 
under multidimensional poverty. So you see that shows that uh, we have a policy disaster by removing that uh, subsidy. And after all, those who are targeted, who used to corner the oil subsidy, will still benefit from what is going on. So, so long as the government will not take uh, the bull by the horn and, uh, you know, face those who are sabotaging the economy uh, and uh, they just take the easiest way to pass it on to the common person, I think that will uh, still show how dangerous uh, the policy is. Okay. Well, um, we'll move on to other things. Um, they, the president has sworn in new ministers. They, the headline there is, Tinubu swears in new ministers as FEC meets today. So we had like 48 ministers. We're still having them. We may still have more ministers before, before the end of this tenure. Maybe we'll have up to 50 or 60 ministers before the end of this tenure. Uh, I don't know how you feel about uh, the fact that we, some people were talking about cutting the cost of government, and this government is, uh, is expanding the cabinet and doing other things that we thought they would not do. Yes. You see, since we returned to uh, civil rule in 1999 to date, which is uh, 25 or 26 years now, we have never had such a large... Uh, a cabinet than now. And uh, ironically, we are having such a large cabinet at a time when the economy is terribly down, okay? So we think uh, that the government uh, which uh, promise that uh, they are going to implement the Orotsenye Commission report, which um, advocate the downsizing of the government. People were jubilating, were happy that, yes, CI yeah, is a government that could seriously implement that. But on the contrary, uh, we are seeing the government enlarging uh, itself. And uh, so this is a, a double jeopardy, that uh, the economy is in crisis, and yet we are increasing the post of governance. And, um, well, uh, the sad element is, like I said earlier on, that the people are getting poorer and poorer by the day. So I think uh, the, the government needs to look at uh, this issue also seriously and see how it cuts uh, uh, the size of the governance. And uh, we shouldn't put more emphasis on political consideration. Of course, enlarging the cabinet is more of political consideration rather than an economically viable policy, rather than, you know, a judicious policy. So I think um, uh, even at this size, uh, it is uh, too much for the country, let alone as you uh, jokingly predict, perhaps we are going to see more and more ministers coming in. And by that time, we don't know whether the government will be able to finance itself to run uh, the country. Well, according to IMF, uh, that is a different headline now. According to IMF, Nigeria, okay, the Naira is under pressure and Nigeria may seek dollar loan. That's what the IMF is saying. We have been saying, or the government has been saying that there will be no borrowing, zero borrowing for this government. And we are seeing borrowings upon borrowings upon borrowings. And now IMF is saying that, that we might need another loan to in order for us to survive? Yeah, you see, take a loan will push us deeper into the uh, debt trap. Already, uh, as we spoke earlier on, on this pilot, the government need, one is planning to borrow money. And now we are saying we need loan uh, in order to support the Naira. I, I think this, this, uh, the government has to look at uh, these issues uh, as well. Look, the, the policy that we have done uh, in the last four months, I think uh, we, since we are in a democratic government, the, the, the government should be responsive to the aspirations and the earnings of Nigerians. Uh, because I am uh, keep on pushing uh, things to us. I think even yesterday it was uh, the same uh, punch that carried the 
news that uh, IMF is uh, recommending that the government has to uh, increase its uh, tax. Okay, so now they are pushing us into more taxation. They are pushing us into more loans while we are going deeper and deeper into the economic crisis. So I think we, the, the government and its advisors should look at uh, this issue. Uh, at least we know that uh, we have tried these policies and they have failed. After all, since the time we took, um, uh, since the time of SAP, uh, we have been trying the same policies and they have never uh, even once taken us out uh, out of the economic crisis. And uh, as the saying goes, uh, you cannot, uh, only a foolish person can be doing the same thing to expect a different results. Since 1985 to date, we have been trying these measures of the uh, IMF and they have been failing us. So I think it's high time now we take the bull by the horn, alternative policies uh, that will take us out of the economic doldrum that we are in now. Okay. Well, well, we'll move over to the Guardian newspaper. Guardian newspaper leads with firm scale down production, opt for trade over effects, income concerns. Firms scale down production, opt for trade over FX income concerns. What are your comments, please? Yeah, my comment is that this too is related to the issue that we are talking about. Uh, already, uh, we are seeing the side effect of it. Some have uh, some uh, companies or farms have cut down uh, their production. Uh, some like uh, uh, Glasgow Smiths are uh, winding up and getting out of the country. That is what uh, the Guardian reported, that they are taking out, I mean, they are winding up and going out of the country. And uh, there is also fear that this will push us into a recession because the purchasing power of uh, Nigerians have been eroded. So you can't expect companies uh, to now produce where people will not uh, consume what they produce. And in addition, you can't uh, expect country, uh, companies to work and function uh, where uh, you have, uh, you know, the foreign exchange is so high and is not, uh, is unavailable. So with all these uh, policies, what we are going to see is uh, a depression. Uh, which is a basic thing, even elementary economics will tell you that where uh, you have such things, uh, there will be an unemployment, and then uh, people will not have the purchasing power to buy the things. So the end result will be uh, factories will cut production, they will also cut, uh, uh, they will retrench their workers, and then we will have more serious problems. And as Guardian said uh, in, in the same thing, uh, there is also the danger that if this thing persists, it may even lead to civil arrest. So I think uh, these are all the things that shows us that uh, this IMF sponsored uh, policy is a disaster for us and that uh, we need to do something about uh, the policy in time. As they say, a stitch in time saves, saves nine. nine. Uh, okay, or oh, Zebrudaya will say a stick in time saves Nama. <laughs> I don't know if you know Zebrudaya. <laughs> okay, well, there is this small headlines uh, down below uh, inside the Guardian. Khan, that is the Christian Association of Nigeria, blames poor leadership for Nigeria's exclusion from uh, UN Council. Remember that the UN uh, General Assembly elected 15 new members to the Human Rights Council, and so many other small countries in Africa got very, very substantial uh, votes. Uh, some of the people who got these votes, or the countries that got these votes, Malawi uh, topped the voting for African nations with 182 votes followed by Côte d'Ivoire with 181, Ghana 179 votes, Burundi 168 votes, uh, and Nigeria had three votes when every other country was getting up to 100 plus. Nigeria got three votes 
into that council, uh, the UN General Assembly uh, Human Rights Council. We couldn't even get up to 10 votes. We had three votes. Now the Christian Association of Nigeria is blaming uh, poor leadership for this disaster that we face because that's how a lot of people see it. Oh, yes. You see, it is a real disaster, and uh, uh, it is also a shameful thing diplomatically. Uh, Nigeria used to, used to be called the giant of Africa, and where, when, you know, we provide the leadership wherever Nigeria uh, went at that time, other countries uh, uh, parallel. But now in a situation like this, where you have even smaller countries, at, uh, you know, getting more than 100 times, uh, more than, let's say not 100 times, more than uh, uh, 10 times, or let's say 20 times the vote we got, this will tell us that uh, something is wrong, and particularly the issue of uh, leadership. I quite agree with Khan on this issue that uh, poor leadership is what is taking us this. So uh, we shouldn't uh, play the ostrich, uh, you know, to hide ourselves and our head and think we are beating ourselves. We have to look at this. Uh, even though we look at it as if it is domestic uh, policy, it has uh, it has serious uh, international repercussion, and these are some of the price that we uh, we are paying for bad governance or bad leadership. So I think this one also is something that we need to seriously look at, uh, because if we think what we are doing is right and we are deceiving ourselves that we are doing the right thing. Uh, by the time things like this happen, uh, we are uh, going to have a shocker. And this is a very serious shocker that we, we are seeing now on the international scale. And in addition to uh, poor leadership, which is also related to that, uh, we cannot go into issues like human rights, where we have uh, serious abuses of human rights where we have serious conflict at home uh, for years now. Uh, we are unable to address these issues. Uh, we seem to be turning our heads uh, away from the uh, crisis. So I think uh, this will show our leaders that there is need to critically look at our stuff and uh, especially the issue of, of leadership so that uh, we can put Nigeria once more uh, into you know a, a, a leadership position in the world, and uh, that uh, will earn us respect, and uh, you know uh, in world affairs, and it will also uh, enable us to address issues that are uh, challenging to us here at home. Mm. Okay, we really do hope that Nigeria will return to that to being that giant of Africa. But as we are the giants, the components of this giant, the the body of this giant needs to be very healthy. I'm talking about the people in Nigeria. Because right now, still on the Guardian there, um, two headlines. Importers grown over 200% surge in duty amid Naira fluctuation. And there's also anxiety as MTEF is yet to arrive National Assembly two months after deadline. Let's begin with import duties skyrocketing to 200%. Yeah, you see, that was what I said earlier on, that uh, these are some of the issues that uh, uh, the, the, the policy side effect of it. We are now increasing import duty. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are saying one of our major economic policies is to uh, attract foreign investment. So you can't uh, attract foreign investment where you have such huge... Uh, I put it in a way like taxation. And uh, that is why even the ones you have at home, one, they will not be able to import. You know, uh, economics um, or investors are very sensitive to uh, issues like uh, security, instability, taxation, and other things, uh, corruption. These are all some of the things that uh, you know, are scare uh, investors not to invest in a country. And where you don't have the indigenous industries, you know, capable of meeting our own uh, needs, we have to depend on foreign investors. 
And now when you take the policy of increasing, you know, duty and taxations on things that come in, then uh, along with a, a poor, uh, you know, a, a weak a, a, a monetary system, a weak uh, a value of the Naira, you don't, uh, you are just shooting yourself in the foot and uh, things will not go on well because the investors will not uh, come in. Even those who are in, uh, they may either wind up and go out or they may cut down uh, their production because uh, our own industries depend largely on foreign importation. And where you have such um, a heavy uh, taxation, I think people uh, will not uh, invest where they will lose uh, seriously. Okay. Uh, well, we do hope that uh, they will look into this. But the second one I, I mentioned was that uh, the uh, medium-term expenditure framework is yet to arrive National Assembly two months after uh, the deadline was given. And I don't know how this will affect our economy and the planning process uh, for everything. Yeah, you see, once you don't have a uh, budgetary system, uh, the, I mean, a, an effective budget, uh, you know the government will shut it down. Even though we have not been able to see it like in other countries where the government will shut down once the budget expired, uh, but I think this is a very serious uh, issue, that two months after the deadline, we... Uh, the the, the uh, proposal or the uh, this budget is yet to reach uh, the National Assembly. So even if it reached there, now it will take no less than another one month uh, for the government, uh, I mean, for the budget to be deliberated and approved. And then you see, if care is not taken, we are going to see no less than other two or three months ahead before the, the budget uh, starts start uh, being implemented. So I think uh, this uh, will cripple the government, huh? uh, and uh, it will be highly unconstitutional for the government to approve. I mean, to operate without an approved uh, budget. Uh, even if uh, they will say the uh, the main one has not expired, but I think that is something uh, bad. And besides, it is also a political. A, you know, a, a problem for the government. You know, uh, when this government uh, was about to be sworn in, one of the things that endeared it uh, that raised the hope of Nigeria is that the president promised that he will hit the ground running on the very day that he was sworn. But these are things that are showing that uh, the government is not uh, hitting the ground or has not hit the ground uh, to take up because two months after the deadline, I think that is uh, something. In other climb, this is going to be a, you know, a major uh, legal or constitutional problem where you have a deadline and uh, you just could not meet it for two months. Well, FEC is meeting today and the economy takes the center stage, according to the Nation newspaper, the economy takes uh, center stage as FEC meets today. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, if, if you had the opportunity, what would take the center stage? Is it the economy? Is it security? Or everything is intertwined? You see, uh, government is a, literally, they, they said it's a, it's a giant. Uh, so we, yes, the issue of economy and the issue of security should have been the major issues. Not that we, we should ignore others, but these are the most daunting challenges that we are facing now, uh, insecurity and uh, the economy. So I think uh, this should have been the major uh, issues uh, at stake. And uh, after all, uh, without either of these two, I don't think... Um, the, the country can go anywhere. So I think it is not just to deliberate on the issue, but to take a serious a step, uh, a policy measures on these uh, twin problems of uh, economy and uh, insecurity. Because other 
elements if you are able to address this in other elements uh, could uh, uh, you know easily be uh, addressed like the issue of unemployment like uh, like uh, other things you know when you address economy when you address security i think that will be a major step but like i said uh, focusing on this does not mean we ignore the others mm -hmm. but this should have been the major priorities of the uh, uh, today. Okay, let's let's take the discussion out of uh, Nigeria. Uh, finally, this is the final question that um, I'm bringing to you. Uh, Wei and uh, Bokai neck and neck in Liberia poll. So generally, how would you assess what is happening in Liberia? Wei is the sitting uh, president, and there's another person who is going neck and, he and neck with him in this present election. So in terms of uh, the preparation and the delivery of the electoral body in that country and the peace or otherwise in that country, how would you rate the, would, how would you rate rather, uh, I wanted to say assess, how would you rate the election in Liberia? Okay, so far uh, we can rate it uh, very good because uh, in you no know, one of the the issue of uh, incumbency factor. But here we are uh, in a place where the president and the opposition are running neck to neck. Uh, so I think if uh, anything will show, this will show that uh, there is some element of fairness. At least uh, the opposition is not being muzzled. And uh, perhaps if uh, these things uh, go as expected, we are likely to see a change, or at least we are going to see an election that will reflect the wishes of uh, the people. Because, uh, like I said, we have cynical view in Africa about incumbency factor. In other places, you will not even hear of the opposition. Or even if you hear about them, they will be running far distant uh, behind the incumbent uh, 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 president. But uh, in Liberia, what we are hearing now uh, is an indication that at least some level playing ground field is allowed in uh, the political processes of the country. Okay. Uh, well, um, that is the country that holds the Guinness Book of Records for the most fraudulent election in history, where a population of about 15,000 voted in, in an election and somebody won with over 127,000 votes <laughs> in a country, so 15 million, yeah. And then he had about 127 million votes in that country. Registered voters were way below the amount of votes he had. But that means if they have reached this point, like you said, there's a, a possibility that they, it is very, very transparent. But let me just... By way of information, we are hoping to get tomorrow um, a family, two young uh, siblings, one is nine years, the other one is 13, I think, that developed an app that will help the country or any other country to conduct elections seamlessly and without any room for fraud. Now the question is, Will they be recognized in Nigeria, and would that their potential be tapped into? There was a global competition, and these people, out of 2,000-plus participants from about 18 countries, they came, they were among the last 15 standing, and after that, they won in their category. So tomorrow, we hope to have them on the show uh, to showcase the thing, but the fear is, no matter how good that might be, will they be recognized? Is there any mechanism in Nigeria to recognize people like that? We remember that when they were looking for the logo for Nigeria Airways, they contracted it outside and spent millions of money to get a logo that could have been a competition within secondary schools, even in Nigeria, or tertiary institutions, or whoever can do it, and then they design it. And even if they have to spend that money, it would have been spent in Nigeria. So I don't know how this will go. But I, that is just an aside. It's not a question. I just told you what, if you have the 
time to watch tomorrow, you should watch and see what these little kids have been able to do, geniuses that are from Nigeria, and we do hope somebody very important will be watching tomorrow to see what can be done with this. We'd like to thank you, Professor, for coming on the show this morning. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. We've been talking with Professor uh, Camilo Page, uh, a public affairs analyst. He's, he's been talking to us on the headlines on some of our national dailies. We will take a short break. When we return, we'll start our first hot topic, and we hope that you're going to still be there. <laughs>